Uh, welcome to our ninth plasma event of 2024. My name is Elia Vargas. I'm a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Media Study and the curator of the 2024 plasma series. We are quickly reaching the end of this series uh, for this season, and I'm sure for the students in the class, you're very excited about that. Nonetheless, the remaining speakers uh, are quite exciting. Before we get to this evening's important guest, uh, I want to share our upcoming final three speakers who will be a uh, longtime media art avatar, Orphan Drift, architect, media artist, and theorist, Mark Shepard, and moving image artist, Christine Marie. Uh, please join us for those talks. They'll each be quite different and very wonderful. Plasma, performances, lectures, and screenings by media artists is sponsored by the University at Buffalo's Department of Media Study, and funding is provided by the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Department of Art. Plasma is a public speaker series that brings innovative, and celebrated artists from a national and international context to the Buffalo area. It is also a course that exposes new and experimental forms of media arts to undergraduate students. You all know what to do now. Uh, for the students, please uh, be ready to sign in using the phrase climate justice. So go to your week 11 modules, sign in. Uh, it is open and it will remain open for one minute. The phrase again is climate justice. A brief note for the students in the class, uh, your final assignment will be posted on Brightspace later this week. So look out for that announcement. This talk is being streamed live, so welcome to those of you attending remotely. Uh, if you've attended remotely before, you know uh, we cannot take uh, remote questions. Uh, questions at the end will be in person only. It is my privilege to introduce today's guest speaker, TJ Demos. For many of you, I hope TJ needs no introduction. He is a leading voice in the visual culture of ecology and politics. He has written prolifically on the intersections and entanglements of art and environmental justice. Indeed, against the prevailing so-called epic of our current age, the Anthropocene. At the risk of making the universal, if ever there was such a thing, personal, I will add, TJ is not only critical and imaginative in thought, but a generous thinker as well. This is something I have witnessed for years in numerous settings. His approach is open and inviting, and it stewards collective critical thought. His work identifies, quote, a range of experimental models that have forcefully materialized formations of politico-ecological aesthetics and practices. By foregrounding speculative imagination, he says, these creative ecologies not only critically expose oppressive structures, but also open up emancipatory futures, new worlds beyond catastrophic climate breakdown, 
colonial domination and social injustice. TJ teaches art history and visual culture at UC Santa Cruz and directs its Center for Creative Ecologies. He writes about contemporary art, global politics, and ecology, and is the author of numerous books, including Decolonizing Nature, Contemporary Art and Political Ecology, Against the Anthropocene, Visual Culture and Environment Today, and most recently, Radical Futurisms, Ecologies of Collapse, Chronopolitics, and Justice to Come. He co-edited The Rutledge Companion on Contemporary Art, Visual Culture, and Climate Change, was a Getty Research Institute Fellow, and directed the Mellon-funded Sawyer Seminar Research Project, Beyond the End of the World. I'm very excited to bring TJ to the UB community. Please welcome TJ Demos. All right. Um, thank you so much, um, Elia. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks all uh, for coming. Welcome if you're online. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, at uh, Professor Eli Vargas's invitation also, because as he mentioned, we've spent lots of time uh, working together and thinking together, I think also in uh, collective contexts in uh, Santa Cruz, where I teach, um, uh, including in uh, group discussions that the Center uh, of Creative Ecologies has um, organized and put together. So we've all also really benefited from, from his contributions over the years. So um, we're sorry that he's here and not in uh, Santa Cruz. Um, and it's also great to be here because um, uh, of Professor Paige Sarlin, uh, whom I've known for a long time. Maybe I shouldn't say how long, but it's been longer than probably many of you uh, are, are alive. Uh, but um, uh, it's great to see her again, as always. Um, and uh, I just want to say you're very lucky uh, to have such brilliant, engaging, um, and energetic uh, uh, professors uh, here at uh, BU and in the uh, Department of Media Study. So um, thank you so much again for the invitation. And I'm going to share, I'm going to uh, talk about some of my uh, uh, current work and situate it, first of all, in relationship to, to some of my um, earlier projects, some of these books um, uh, I have in mind here, where I've had, I've developed over the, the last uh, decade or so, um, an engagement, uh, a research engagement, looking at uh, artistic practice, experimental modes of artistic practice um, at the intersection with uh, political ecology and um, uh, environmental studies. Um, and uh, that goes back to decolonizing nature. These 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 books that I've I've written over the years against the Anthropocene, beyond the world's end, and most recently um, this book, Radical Futurisms. Um, I also, as I as I as I mentioned, as uh, Elia mentioned, direct the Center for Creative Ecologies. If you're interested in this, you can check this out um, and uh, look further at some of the the resources. When we do events, often we record them and then make them available for free. Online, but this is also um, an uh, uh, an institution that I created when I came to UC Santa Cruz in 2015, um, and it's a platform to uh, again uh, uh, enable discussions of an expanded approach that's more uh, political, I would say, uh, to uh, things environmental and ecological that doesn't just look at, for instance, uh, carbon in the atmosphere, but also considers powers on the ground within the broader and hundreds year uh, uh, history of racial, what I'll call racial colonial capitalism. Um, so speaking of that, I wanna, I wanna talk about a recent essay um, and some of my current research that I'm working on right now, uh, which has to do with policing and counterinsurgency. So this, this, this essay on uh, counter, it's called Counterinsurgent, Cop City, Abolition, Ecology, and the Aesthetics of Counter Reform came out um, last month in uh, EFLUX and you can check it out there. Uh, if you're inter interested, it's, it's open access and uh, freely uh, downloadable. 
Um, and I'd like to talk about this and walk, kind of walk you through informally my argument and some of the reasons why I'm, I'm making this case uh, uh, in relationship to uh, the, 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 the nexus of policing, counterinsurgency, um, environmental justice struggles, and uh, abolition and decolonization. So in some ways, this goes back to my last book, uh, Radical Futurisms, which is an attempt to consider uh, what um, um, emancipatory worlds to come look like. And in that book, I explore this and map it out uh, and, and do research in relationship to this, in, in relation to this topic, looking at uh, what some like Walter Benjamin um, and also more recently Robin Kelly call traditions of the oppressed. So the book looks at uh, um, how Afrofuturist traditions, indigenous futurist traditions, eco-socialist ones, um, multi-species ones are considering uh, futurity uh, in relation to the contemporary present uh, of um, forms of, uh, again, racial colonial capitalism. Um, so given these emancipatory futures, and there's many, uh, there's lots of visions for uh, worlds to come that are based on forms of liberation. Um, I, I want to ask now, like, why why aren't we getting there? Why aren't we making any progress toward uh, forms of emancipation? Along with many other thinkers who are who are posing these kinds of questions as well. I'm also thinking specifically about um, environmental struggles and the like, environmental slash climate justice movements um, over the last few decades. Uh, why, given all the energy that's gone into um, uh, climate-related activism, why are increasingly um, people who are research researching this and even participating in the struggles, why are they saying we're losing? Why are we losing, right? And I think that, that I would agree with that. I think we are losing. I think the, broadly speaking, the environmental justice uh, and climate justice movements are losing. Um, we know, like, if you just look at the uh, most obvious sites of um, uh, global climate governance measured in the meetings, the annual meetings of the, uh, the, the, the UN climate summits that have been going on for now for more than 30 years. We know that during that exact same time, uh, carbon um, and greenhouse gases continue to rise steadily. Um, they're not going down. They're, there's no correlate. There's an there's a opposite correlation, uh, it seems, between the energies of global climate governance and productions of climate-destroying um, um, conditions. Um, so why why is that the case? Um, so it's with that I want to I want to think about um, policing as a, a structural function of counterinsurgency, and I'm thinking along with, for instance, uh, the work of the Nigerian American uh, philosopher Olufemi Taiwo, who poses this question in an essay that he wrote a few years ago um, in Descent, where he says. He, he says that climate apartheid is a system of socio-environmental inequality that's enforced by police violence uh, is on the rise. Um, and this is his, the essay is titled Climate Apartheid is the Coming uh, Police Violence Crisis. Um, um, so in, you know, why is that? Why is that the case? What is happening? Um, how, is, how, how do we think about policing as a, a, a force of counterinsurgency in our lives that's working counter to the insurgency of climate justice? Uh, that's that's the, the, the question that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to get at. So if this is the case, if um, climate apartheid is the coming police violence crisis, uh, then Cop City Atlanta, what's happening in Cop City Atlanta uh, offers an ominous flashpoint for this. Uh, on the right, you see a still of um, the uh, one, one recent um, um, tree sit and uh, encampment within the Wilani Forest, as it's called, just outside of Atlanta, uh, where you can see forest defense is self-defense. This is uh, part of a, 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 a several year long activist engagement uh, that's referred to now as the Stop Cop City uh, movement or Defend the Atlanta Forest movement. So what is happening in Atlanta? Um, and as you'll see, I'll, I'll argue that this isn't just about um, a local struggle. Uh, it's not just about Atlanta. This is much broader than that. 
Um, it's deeply historical, um, and it not only extends out in you know nationally in terms of um, other types of developments across the United States, but connects to long histories actually of policing as a form of counterinsurgency internationally and across the last uh, couple centuries. Um, so these are um, a couple diagrams of uh, the police training facility that's being proposed in the city of Atlanta. And you can see how it's carved out of the um, this uh, this forest, which is surrounded by um, largely African-American neighborhoods and um, includes all these different elements, uh, including um, uh, live shooting ranges, um, training centers for uh, like like uh, a small city in which police can train in urban counterinsurgency, uh, in crowd control, in the, in the use of uh, tear gas. Um, there's a Black Hawk helicopter pad that's planned for this um, and more. So there's, it's, it, it's, it's a, a massive, uh, large-scale installation of police training that's proposed at a cost of uh, uh, roughly about $130 million. Um, so the, the cost um, of uh, where that comes from and what that means and what it comes out of is also really important to consider. So you can see that this is in the last uh, year or so, they've been making progress on um, on what we call Cop City from a, a different, a, a specific kind of political perspective that's opposed to this. And if you have questions about policing, we can talk about that as well. Uh, but since um, uh, April to May in, in 2023, you can see the amount of forest that they've already cleared. Um, the forest is, um, a really important area ecologically in Atlanta. It's um, a home to biodiversity, to migratory species. Um, it's really important, you may know, um, to have tree cover to mitigate the effects of global warming. Uh, and certainly Atlanta in the south is experiencing a lot of, uh, of heating in that area. Uh, it also offers protections uh, against flooding Right, um, the trees, the forests, the the all the, the the sensitive ecosystem creates conditions that absorb water, so it's not it's not prone to runoff uh, when you have torrential downpours. So in many ways, it's it, it's it's really an ecologically sensitive area. Uh, Atlanta is one of the last places that, where you have a kind of urban forest, so that's really important as well. So that, th these are all part of the reasons why um, organizers and activists and people who are, are politically involved are completely opposed to this. Um, on the one hand, it brings it, it makes a proposal for expanding uh, the intensity and range uh, of policing. Um, and on the other hand, it, it proposes installing this huge area uh, in the very place of a, a, a biodiverse forest. So it's, it's uh, an act of deforestation coupled with the structural violence of uh, policing. Um, just to give a very brief uh, uh, explanation of a little bit more historical context for this. So this, this, this uh, police training facility was proposed um, just in the aftermath uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement, which we know um, at this point from around you know 2016 to 20 was heavily involved in um, criticizing racialized policing and the kind of spectacular in, in, uh, incidents of police brutality that uh, that occurred then, that occurred long before that, and are still occurring today. Um, so activists and uh, in part the Black Lives Matter social movement came up with proposals that we now refer to or they did then and before as abolitionist, right? We have to rethink conditions of uh, what makes communities safe. And the, the argument went police do not do that. Police, in fact, exacerbate conditions of safety, as does the prison industrial complex. Locking people up in cages does not help m make people safe, uh, nor does um, having police who have discretionary use of violence to go around and patrol streets. So um, abolitionists like Nicole Siegel, for instance, refer to police work as violence work. 
Uh, this is something that is, um, again, it's not a, a, a situation of having a few bad apples on a police force. This is a structural function. Uh, this is exactly what police are for. And if you look back at, and do a history of policing, uh, in terms of a structural function, you'll see that in general, they have long served as a force of uh, reaction, whether it's about um, uh, uh, organizing slave patrols uh, during the era of uh, racialized slavery in the States, or putting down um, organized labor militancy and worker strikes, um, or dealing with surplus populations, homelessness, migration. More recently in the era of post-industrial advanced capitalism, police have long been a tool, an instrument of ruling class uh, management of uh, conditions of um, profound economic and political inequality. So um, people were uh, opposed to this um, um, for a long time. Uh, abolition has a long history, as I've just alluded to, but more recently uh, in relationship to the proposal, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, the proposal to, instead of defunding the police, which was the, uh, the BLM call that was largely shared uh, by um, activists associated with abolition, that call to defund the police was transformed somehow politically into a different kind of slogan, which is ref we need to refund the police in order to get better training, right? How did, how did that happen? Like that, that itself is like a site um, of counterinsurgency. So how do we move from defunding the police to refunding the police, giving the police even more resources so ostensibly they can train better um, and protect people better? That's the argument. Um, but that's what people, um, activists associated with Stop Cop City are opposed to. And we're seeing this logic of, uh, of transforming defund the police into refund the police um, happening at the national level and happening all across the country. So activists early on, um, over the last couple of years have been uh, challenging the conditions of uh, the police training facility, including through forms of civil disobedience and sabotage, in addition to all other sorts of uh, activist and organizing strategies, uh, like organizing protests, um, doing um, uh, teach-ins and this, you know, uh, community-based discussions, uh, attempting to vote out members of the city council in Atlanta who have supported um, uh, Cop City, uh, coming up with a citizen's referendum to put the uh, question of Cop City up to a public vote. And each of these steps, whether it's electoral politics, whether it's social movement organizing, whether it's petition drives and uh, 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 street protests, or whether it's civil disobedience, or whether it's sabotage, each of them are shut down systematically. Uh, by the city and the city council and uh, the police in Atlanta. So at one point, um, the Georgian uh, Senator Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, the, you know, the, um, the conspiracy theorist advocate and, um, uh, well, lots more could be said about her as a reactionary political figure, uh, but she referred to um, events like this as the actions of Antifa terrorists. Uh, so this is uh, another key term um, and instrumental strategy on behalf of the state and also policing to ultimately delegitimize um, um, legitimate political dissent uh, and turn what is politically unacceptable into something that is criminal, right? This is a, um, uh, a, a typical strategy of the state, and it's also um, a longstanding um, counterinsurgency tactic, um, basically to use um, the forces of a kind of um, propaganda uh, delegitima de de delegitimation of um, of uh, of dissent uh, through the use of terms like terrorism. So I want to look at Cop City, and I do in this article, which is part of a larger research project. But I, I look at it at, as Cop City at the nexus of these different uh, forces, including. Financial states of exception. I'll talk about these um, progressively in, in, the, in my presentation today. Uh, police violence, colonial racial capitalism, lawfare, the use of law as a form of warfare, uh, and algorithmic social media. 
so all of these make up the Pentagon, um, which I'm choosing that military, military uh, metaphor purposefully, that represents uh, the model um, or the paradigm of what Cop City is. Um, so um, this is also coming at a time I mentioned where commentators and activists and thinkers, researchers, were working in the broad area of climate um, justice activism uh, are saying we're at a time when we're losing, where the struggle is losing after decades. Um, we're not making progress. It, it's actually failing. I'm thinking of Matt Huber. Uh, these are just two examples. There's, there's many more, but these have been, I think these are really um, provocative and useful uh, positions in the current politics uh, of environmentalism. Matt Huber, climate change is class war is one really important, I think, recent um, contribution. And then Andreas Malm's book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Uh, Malm, uh, so Huber calls for uh, resituating climate and environmental protest within a class-based framework where we have to, we should, he advocates, we should understand climate politics not as um, like an idea politics of a professional managerial class that often is white and middle class and masculine. But actually we have to think of a working class, international um, uh, composition of a, a political agent that is struggling for a, a politics of life because that's what ultimately it's about. But it's not a pol politics of life where we should recommend um, degrowth or uh, uh, carbon, carbon shaming. We should instead think about how working class people have suffered decades already of austerity. Um, and they don't need to degrow. It's really billionaires that we need to degrow. We need to grow. We need to actually invest more in uh, public education, in free education, in infrastructure, in um, uh, health care. Um, all the things that can help us um, imagine a future of, uh, of collective well-being. Andreas Baum, on the other hand, is thinking about strategy of, uh, of protests, of, of uh, activist tactics. So as he indicates with the title of the book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, he's saying, he, his, his analysis is that the climate movement has been too focused in, on, uh, on nonviolence. Um, over many decades. Uh, but given the momentous transformation that we're seeing that could spell disaster uh, worldwide in terms of climate breakdown, um, it's time that activists need to consider alternate, more aggressive strategies. So he's advocating uh, considering what he calls the art of uh, the fine art of political violence, including destruction of, uh, of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so th these raise lots of really um, complex and difficult challenging tactical and strategic questions about climate and environmental organizing. Who's the subject? Uh, how can that subject be broadened beyond the limited class fraction of uh, the professional managerial class? And what kind of tactics are uh, appropriate um, and necessary. And I would also add, like, how can we bring um, uh, a nuanced and responsible conversation to these questions? Uh, because otherwise, there's an immediate danger, for instance, of advocating something like sabotage uh, without thinking about what that means and what kind of um, reaction it puts in place, right? That's, the, that's a, a kind of uh, danger that, I, in my view, uh, Andreas, uh, doesn't consider enough, or really much at all in, in the book. So um, just a few other um, explanations of what you're looking at here. Um, on the sides, more uh, documentation of the, uh, the Stop Cop City protests. And in the top middle, um, Justice for Tort, Tort de Gita, uh, was a, um, um, a uh, member of the Stop Cop City Defend the Atlanta Forest Movement. Um, and he was uh, in the encampment when there was a, a SWAT style police raid of the, of the area and he was shot, uh, 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 according to forensic evidence, about 57 times uh, with his hands raised. He was shot in the hands. 
Um, and uh, it just gives you a sense of what happens when activists challenge the police order. This can be, this can lead to uh, a lethal uh, reaction on, on behalf of the, um, of the state. So in terms of thinking about policing, police, there's lots of research on policing. Um, you can research this more if you're interested. I think it's important to be aware of what's going on with, with policing um, and why policing is the way it is in, in the States because it's different in the, in the international context depending on where we're looking. Uh, but there's some some of the uh, texts that I've looked at, um, the rise of the warrior cop, um, what's called killology, uh, the the so-called science of um, of the police minimalization of uh, risk by uh, being willing to um, uh, neutralize that risk through killing uh, a person. These are all dominant models of policing these days. Um, and it's been um, widely researched as a form of counterinsurgency that, that in some cases, some authors argue comes out of colonial context, like in Northern Ireland, for instance, in the, the English uh, colonization of Ireland, and also uh, in the American context, the Philippines, and the American, the US uh, occupation and colonization of the Philippines in the 19th century. And then you have forms of policing that looks like this in Atlanta, on the bottom left, a SWAT team with their armored vehicle, and on the top right, these are the kinds of militarized policing that some think is relatively new. That is the militarization of the police in the, in the US. This goes way back though, actually. There's a long history um, and fluidity between the police as a domestic executive force and the military as an international one, right? There's actually lots of fluidity between these categories historically. And then on the bottom right, I'm thinking uh, about PredPol, uh, PredPol is uh, short for predictive policing, using algorithms and, uh, uh, and statistical data, big data, to map out um, uh, near future crime zones. And so that police can respond preemptively to areas of criminality before they, they even occur. This is what's on the table right now in terms of the development of um, uh, high-tech policing uh, today. So, um, how does this fit in with uh, with art and visual culture? Well, that's a that's a um, a really important question, and I bring this into my discussion um, in part through the work of uh, the French philosopher Jacques Ranciere, who's um, an important voice um, in what we might refer to as the politics of aesthetics. Aesthetics, referring to in this context, not. Uh, the like the Enlightenment's um, um, theory of uh, of the beautiful. It's rather, in Ranciere's case, less value laden, and it simply refers to the organization of the sensible. So aesthetics is a, a multi sensory relation to the to the world. We might say. Um, Ranciere wants to think about this as um, a form of policing. The aesthetics, that is, the aesthetic is uh, a form of policing. And he writes, um, the police is um, uh, an order of bodies that defines the allocation of ways of doing, ways of being and ways of saying, and sees those bodies are assigned by the name to a particular place and task. Um, so... It's an order of the visible and the sayable that sees that a particular uh, activity is visible and another is not. Um, that this speech is understood as discourse and another as noise. So um, yeah, that's from disagreement in the mid-90s, 1995, um, where uh, Ranciere spends time in this book detailing the structural function that is policing. He doesn't want to think so much about day-to-day -day policing. Uh, for instance, the conditions of, um, for instance, the racialized body in relationship to police brutality. He's thinking more um, in, uh, in a way it's more abstract in terms of this um, kind of aesthetic structural function. And that's itself is, um, uh, has its limits, obviously. Um, you know, as abolitionists, like, for instance, Angela Davis and Gina Dent and many others, 
uh, I, I mentioned Nicole Siegel, like they're really focused on the day-to-day -day maintenance of violence work that leads to these um, spectacularized, uh, um, uh, extremely violent interactions between police and people. Ron Sierra isn't thinking so much about that, but nonetheless, I think this is a really an important and useful way of thinking of drawing, bringing aesthetics into the question of uh, policing. And I wanted, I, I'm thinking about this more broadly. I'm not, I didn't, I don't really uh, say this in my text, but I'm thinking about um, like this, this idea of uh, defining what's sayable and hearable as much broader than the police. And, and the, the big question here is not just the police as people with badges on their uniforms, but how the police function gets inhabited or taken up by all sorts of people, including potentially uh, any of us, right? So the idea is how do we participate in this logic uh, in the way, in the aesthetic way that Ron Sierra is defining? And certainly within art and art history, to use these categories, this is itself, I think, a form of policing or boundary making. Um, and I'm thinking here about someone who has um, um, a, an uneasy relationship to my own discipline, which is itself a disciplining, right, of our um, knowledge, of our ways of thinking, uh, of saying, and being. Art history itself is, uh, has a policing function. Um, so does where art is, um, is often encountered and seen in institutions, right? Institutions, uh, art museums and galleries commonly have guards wearing uniforms that if someone does something inappropriate, they can intervene. They have discretion to uh, deploy violence. This is key to a police structural function. So I'm thinking about this more broadly in terms of a critique of institutions, including education, like the policing function of professors uh, that we're all asked and sometimes demanded to, um, to, uh, to perpetuate in our different activities. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very challenging, but I think necessary increasingly as we're asked um, more and more, I think these days, to align our activities as within the educational sector, within the art, art sector, with the interests of dominant conditions of advanced capitalism, basically. We're, we're, we're performing these roles increasingly ourselves. So I'm, I wanna think about that, and Ranciere opens a way up, uh, not in terms of aesthetics that you find, like if you think of uh, an art gallery, but more broadly is the structural function of doing uh, the work of, of maintaining the orders of racial colonial capitalism on a day-to-day -day basis. So in that sense, we're all, or, or some of us at least, are maintenance workers, um, right? In, in, that, in, that, uh, in that sense. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to speed up so I get through this in about 45 minutes, um, so I have another 15 minutes or so. I looked at the, like, what's $130 million? Who's funding this? Um, it turns out there's a lot of uh, corporations that are supportive of Stop Cops, of, sorry, of, uh, of Cop City Atlanta, of the police training facility. Um, corporations uh, like uh, Wells Fargo, um, uh, Amazon, um, Chick-fil-A, Delta Airlines, United Parcel Service, UPS, uh, the Home Depot, Waffle, Waffle House, JP Morgan, investment um, banks and financial firms. Private equity is heavily invested in, um, in the uh, police training facility. So they're the ones who are putting up massive amounts of money um, to, to get to see this thing that, that, that it's built. It's not built yet, They're in the, 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 the protests are still continuing. There's hope to shut this down still. Um, but so far, they're making progress. They're actually doing the building. Um, and these are the companies that are supporting them. That includes Motorola. Why, would, why, why do some of these corporations support it? Other than we know that it's in their interest. Generally, historically, if you look, it is the dominant elites, the political and economic elites who support police historically. That's because police um, operate as an in instrument of their own interest. They're the ones who shut down labor militancy. They're the ones who shut down social movements. They're the ones who shut down movements for racial justice, for gender justice, for, um, for all sorts of forms of um, you know, ambitious world transforming political activity. But um, sometimes it's quite literal. Motorola supports um, the, the APF or the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is itself an unusual but typical um, private public association that we see all over the nation. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm sure in Buffalo they, ha they have one too. 
Um, and this is a, a it's it's pu it's public private, so it's not, in other words, public fully in the sense that it would be accountable to some voters, um, but it's not completely private, so it can benefit the uh, police. It's basically a fundraising and networking political um, advocacy uh, uh, institution for the police. So Motorola generates. I'm sorry, donates generously to the, um, the APF. Um, and that's not surprising because the APF in turn buys cameras from Motorola uh, to surveil the city, Atlanta being one of the most surveilled cities in the US. So there's direct um, economic interest. Uh, corporations don't just give to the police because they like police. Um, it's in their direct economic interest. In this case, Motorola, provides the cameras to the city. Um, the city is building a vast um, uh, surveillance network um, um, in collaboration with Microsoft um, to process what it's seeing through all these cameras in public space. So this is also helps get to the aesthetic dimension of policing. Increasingly in the era of, um, of high tech uh, visibility, right, of high-tech media, um, that media is taking on and serves a police function, right, in terms of determining who can do what, where, and when, and what happens if you, if one violates or transgresses that principle, right? This is the um, part of the control room that organizes space on an aesthetic basis in Atlanta that can then deploy police at a moment's notice if there's any challenge um, to the conditions of, um, of everyday life. Um, you see a, uh, an example of here um, of, the, of the US and the amount of, for instance, facial network, fa facial recognition software and resources that are deployed. Uh, I'm sure this is in uh, both Buffalo, it's like heavily represented in, in, the, in the, uh, the east of the country, but not just, it's all over the place. Um, and then you have, for instance, uh, networked uh, doorbell video um, systems like Amazon's Ring um, that has a video camera on the front door of houses that's often connected to um, a recording device, but also to a police um, database. And that can also, with the help of AI, trigger alarms um, if people are seen within the area and recorded. Uh, that can uh, lead to a, a form of uh, predictive policing. We know that facial recognition and, and AI is extremely problematic and comes with all sorts of biases. Uh, that is due in large part to how the training sets are created that ultimately run AI, right, based on largely white faces, so that when it comes to people of color and faces of color, there's a higher, much higher degree of, um, of misrecognition. Uh, and that's no simple thing. That, that, lead, that, that can lead to really dangerous encounters and all sorts of complications that are economic, that are, that are uh, political, that are life-limiting. Um, so this is uh, just an example of a security biometrics facial recognition um, uh, set up recording the face uh, of this guy. Um, the organization Takun says this is part of a control society that is a, a paranoid society. They're a French, a French based um, um, political organization. Uh, some refer to this as algorithmic violence. Uh, so, for instance, here's a, just a, a an image that shows you a, a criminal match and no match, just an example of what this can look like in practice when people can be defined in public spaces and identified, uh, including with any charges that they might have on record. So you're immediately and without knowledge um, uh, uh, situated within a, a, the criminal justice network through technology like this. Um, as this um, as Dan McQuillan writes, who's, who's, who has written this, uh, I think, really useful essay called Non-Fascist AI, he says the risk posed by AI is not a, a, a machine tyranny of automated decisions. 
but rather the amplification of existing human tendencies to automaticity. AI not only undermines due process, but produces thoughtlessness. Indeed, these are forms of everyday fascist thinking, even when not undertaken on behalf of an explicitly far-right regime. Um, people like Joy Bulamwini uh, are doing a lot of great work analyzing the conditions of algorithmic violence and looking at um, facial recognition techniques and the kind of racial biases that are part of these. Um, if you don't know about this, it's really worth looking into uh, her, specifically her project, the, uh, the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, so Jackie Wang and another, another important contributor to an analysis of these conditions, she argues that systems like PredPol conceal how the data and these categories that, and the categories it relies on are already shaped by structural racism. Um, so these, this is the kind of technology that Cop City is going to, um, to amplify and intensify. Um, for instance, taking people who are, uh, whose visibility is captured in a, a city council meeting um, and transformed into um, people charged with domestic terrorism in relationship to their alleged activist activities. So I, I analyze in the text how people are techno-visually transformed into threatening phantasmagoria through, through these technologies, uh, reduced to pixels in probability fields. They become visible figurations of projected risk, and they're statistically consigned to stereotypes of criminality and terrorism that function to automate and dehumanize state response. Another element of Cop City is that it's linked to um, international police training um, uh, resources, including in relation to uh, Israel and Israeli security services. Um, uh, George, the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, or GILE, has had a, a multi-decade long relationship with Israeli security firms. And indeed, Israel, if you look at um, um, uh, their history economically has had, over the last few decades, a, 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 an expanding, growing business in providing security worldwide to governments and uh, policing. Uh, so we're with, we're, it's accurate, I, th I think, to say we're witnessing the globalization of counterinsurgency within neoliberal markets as a commodified industry of oppression. Um, Anthony Lowenstein in his recent book, The Palestine Laboratory, details this. Uh, in other words, how Israel exports the technology of occupation around the world, including to Atlanta, um, which in its cups, in its, its a new police training facility, proposes to continue this program and to develop it with new technologies, uh, including PredPol and using AI within policing. So this is all part of um, the aesthetic function or the aesthetics of politics that Ranciere is trying to get at. And again, it's as that just indicated in relationship to Israel and the kind of destructive um, genocidal conditions we're witnessing right now in, in Gaza, um, this is a laboratory for um, a, a much larger deployment of zones of killability and others uh, enclaves of security. And we're, this is one potential scenario for futurity, a growing expanse of inequality between these, these, um, these areas. Um, Cop City, Atlanta is not the only one. Um, Post Black Lives Matter uh, reinvention or recalibration of policing as a structural function in the maintenance of racial colonial capitalism is spread widely. Um, and these are all, these flags all point to areas where there are currently projects um, to build more police training facilities. So this is happening all over the, um, the country. So um, uh, counterinsurgency has a, a, dis a distinctive, what I call a chronopolitics, a politics of time. It acts as a mode of what Jasper Puar in her book, uh, The Right to Maim, calls uh, prehensive futurity. Prehensive is like grabbing with the hand. Prehensive futurity, produces futurity. For Jasper Puar, um, she writes, the prehensive authorizes a set of predictive facts on the ground, sutured to the language of risk and probability. Indeed, as an 
addition to reactive and preemptive forms of securitization, the prehensive is about making the present look exactly the way it needs to in order to guarantee a very specific and singular outcome in the future. So that's really what counterinsurgency is. And if you read about this more broadly, like if uh, the work of Stuart Schrader is really interesting here, he argues in his book on counterinsurgency, the counterinsurgency comes before the insurgency. Right? The counterinsurgency is not reactive to something, to some transgression or crime that took place. Counterinsurgency comes before. Um, so states, when they're planning um, developments, occupations, um, deforestations, fossil fuel expansion, are investing preemptively in counterinsurgency before there's even any social movement that's formed. I think this is what institutions increasingly are doing these days, right? planning for the insurgency so that they can preemptively uh, neutralize it in advance. So in this regard, um, uh, and here I'm referring to the work of Alberto Toscano, who's been writing about racial fascism recently. Uh, it's not far from what he, building on the black radical tradition um, and writings by people like George Jackson and Angela Davis, uh, terms racial fascism, which is specific to a U.S. founded on racialized slavery and indigenous genocide, and which functions as what he says um, is preventive counter-reform. So that's, again, another word for uh, prehensive futurity, uh, preventive counter-reform, or counter-insurgency. His, his book, his, his article, Racial Fascism, in his recent book called Late Fascism is really, I think, important. It argues for the validity and the, um, the careful, sensitive use of the word fascism in the US context, where it does not and should not refer always and be measured by comparison to uh, Nazi Germany and, and, and the Holocaust. Rather, the US has its own variety of fascism, according to Toscano and, and other art, uh, uh, writers and activists like Angela Davis and George Jackson. Right? And that comes out of um, racialized slavery and uh, indigenous genocide. So we have our own um, uh, national form of uh, fascism, which is not just in the past, it continues today. Um, so moving on, uh, you know, I wanna talk about um, um, Andreas Malm and the, and the tactics of, um, of sabotage, uh, which you could say also has an aesthetic function, right? In terms of creating events like this, the visual impact of seeing a police station burn down is not just the destruction of a precinct, it also serves an aesthetic function. But in her critique of Andreas Malm's uh, radical flank theory, this is the idea that's familiar within organizing uh, that militant activists, you know, those who are doing civil disobedience and extreme direct action, they can render more moderate approaches like people who are not engaging in illegal activity, um, uh, more appealing and more effective. That's the radical flank theory. So radical, the radical flank may fail in its sabotage, but it'll make um, other kinds of approaches more palatable and supportable, right? This is radical flank theory. So, um, um, but Thea Riafrancos in her critique of this points out how aggressive tactics can also be ineffectual. Uh, and even more vulnerable to counterinsurgency without large-scale social movements to back them up. This is from a, um, an article that she wrote um, in, in the last year. And that's really interesting to consider in, in, uh, in relation to um, BLM protests, like the time in 2020 when they burned down a precinct of the uh, Minneapolis police. Um, and polls, political polls after this event found, and this is pretty amazing, that more than 50%, about 53% of the American public supported and found this justified to burn down a police station. That's, I found that, I still find that incredible. That's amazing. Um, and the reason is, she points out, the reason is, I, I don't know if that statistic would hold today, but then it did. Um, and the reason is, she says, is because there are about 20 million people on the streets, right? There was mass movement that was energizing a critical abolitionist lens um, that made radical acts like this of sabotage civil disobedience seem legitimate and justified. Um, okay, so if social movement base building, we could call it, is the surest way of preventing tactics from inadvertently playing into the logic of counterinsurgency, 
and thereby making the politically possible more likely, whether in the name of abolition or climate justice, then how might the arts contribute? So here I'm moving more into thinking about um, actual artistic practice. What would a prehensive arts be? using the, the language of uh, Jasper Puar, a kind of militant research, what would that be? Maybe something like a counter counter uh, insurgency. Maybe that's what we need. Like a, we need to be thinking more strategically about counter counter insurgency. If counter insurgency is preempting insurgency, maybe we need to think a few steps uh, ahead of ourselves. Maybe it would be similar to what Gramsci um, uh, called a possible arts. Uh, one that could contribute to the desired unfolding of a just future. In this case, what I want to call an abolition ecology. Um, I'm going to go a little bit over, but I'm trying to you know, keep it uh, brief. So abolition ecology is a term that um, I propose, along with others, that builds on um, what, for instance, W.B. Du Bois called abolition democracy, right? Um, uh, realizing conditions of democratic uh, equality in the aftermath of slavery. Uh, it relates to what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls abolition geography, thinking about abolition as making freedom a place. How does abolition become a place-making activity, right? And I'm also thinking about uh, multi-species justice. Um, and in a way, the abolition of hierarchies of, um, of species inequality and oppression and violence. So that would all come together in relationship to um, abolition ecology. Um, so that's how I would situate the Stop Cop City movement, uh, defend the Atlanta forest, stop uh, policing, the uh, militarization and violence work from taking place, destroy, not only just, not only abolish policing, but destroy the conditions that make policing seem necessary. This is really the crucial uh, step, I think. Uh, by that, we were talking about um, ending conditions of ultimately economic inequality that is uh, capitalism. Right. So this is a, ultimately an anti-capitalist abolition and decolonial uh, argument. Um, so um, there's lots to you know that's come together to support this, and I'm you know drawing on arguments of people like Kam uh, Kamal Franklin in the. Um, the Community Movement Builders, an African-American organization in Atlanta that's organized. They're, they're one of the spearheads of this organization of uh, stopping Cop City. Um, discussions like this that include um, veteran abolitionists like Angela Davis, as well as younger uh, activists who are all talking about this, how ending police violence necessarily involves ending the conditions that make policing seem necessary. And it also connects to indigenous forms of decolonization. Um, something else that I didn't mention yet is that the police training facility is being proposed to be built on lands that were originally um, the, the homeland of the Muscogee uh, indigenous nation that have long been dispossessed of the lands, yet they're still around and their descendants also are op opposing uh, the cop city. Um, so they, and interestingly, um, last year they sent um, a um, uh, in, uh, they, they sent an eviction notice to Mayor um, Andre uh, Dickens in Atlanta to evacuate the lands that are that are the homeland of Muscogee people, which was an interesting reversal of using an evictions notice against the evictors. So. Um, this is the last section of, of the presentation. I want to ask, okay, this is all really fascinating. Where, where do art institutions stand? What about looking at art institutions in the Atlanta area, uh, like the High Museum? There's several other museums of contemporary art in the area. Why haven't any of them done any, um, and I looked at this, I researched this, why haven't they done any exhibitions related to this uh, or um, events, programming, workshops, discussions. Why is the, why have they been com like completely silent on on the subject? And it's not difficult to find out. Um, their donors of these institutions, like Coca Cola, Home Depot, and Cox Enterprise, which is a local media uh, corporation in Atlanta, are 
the donors of those museums are the same, or you know, they share the donors uh, who are giving money to the Atlanta Police Foundation as well as to art institutions. So this is part of the counterinsurgency function. This is producing institutions that don't or refuse or, or resist uh, even allowing this stuff to emerge from noise into discourse, from you know, the background which can be ignored to the significance of um, an event or um, a symposium or a workshop or an exhibition. You don't have, we don't have anything like this really interesting project that happened at um, the New York Civil Liberties Union in Manhattan uh, uh, last year, which was called 29 Million Dreams. It was an exhibition about the real costs of excessive policing, mainly from an economic point of view. And, and that pointed out, that exhibition and their research pointed out that the NYPD cost New Yorkers $29 million per day um, so this is pretty amazing. Not unusual, though, if you look at the percentages of police budgets in cities, from Buffalo to where I'm from, Santa Cruz, to Chicago, to New York, Philadelphia, wherever, police occupy, they have about a third, um, 30 to 40 percent of resources, typically. So in New York, that would be that. It's a massive amount of money. And the point that they're making, the New York Civil Liberties Union, is imagine what life could be like, what the world could be like if that money was going into other things. For instance, health care, child care, um, education, infrastructure, the subway, buses and trains, public transportation, and how these that, that kind of world would take on a completely different relation also to um, environmental and climate justice, right? So in that sense, I love this slogan, the, the NYPD is defunding us, right? It's not we're defunding the police, it's rather the reverse, they're defunding us. So I ask, what, what could we imagine um, a prehensive arts or an art of the possible? Um, yes, we can, there's lots of models that we could look at and I'll just, sh I'm gonna just flip through a few very quickly. There's um, this one by uh, the London, -based London and Berlin based organization, Forensic Architecture called Environmental Racism in Death Alley, Louisiana. Check out the website, there's lots of amazing research here. Um, which also functions as a, an, uh, an art project in, in, in galleries and museums and biennials that will invite them, and they often do. But this explores how um, uh, petrochemical companies in the area of outside of Lu Louisiana on the Mississippi River um, are expanding and often expanding on lands that were once um, slaveholding plantations. Uh, so there are still, there are today African-American communities who are the descendants of enslaved people who are now suffering the environmental injustice or environmental racism of the expanded petrochemical industry. Um, so if FA along with act, local activists, including the Bucket Brigade, are, are uh, exploring ways to challenge this, including by locating the remains of African-American um, cemeteries from plantation days and getting them recognized legally as heritage sites. So a form of cultural heritage can be used to stop fossil fuel expansion. And that really interestingly and provocatively, I think huge, this is hugely important, brings together uh, racial justice struggles with environmental justice struggles. There's also um, Strike MoMA that happened uh, a few years ago, um, challenging the Museum of Modern Art in New York for its toxic board of trustees where there's many corporate CEOs and billionaires who sit on the board who are invested in all sorts of um, really nefarious activities from police uh, and prison donations and the privatization of prisons to um, supporting uh, Israel and its militarization and occupation to supporting um, very conservative media to supporting reactionary political figures like Trump like this is the Museum of Modern Art, which is often thought about in relationship to radical avant-garde artistic history. But actually, when you look at the politics of the institution, it's, it's exactly the opposite. So it's a case, again, of counterinsurgency, of using radical cultural expressions uh, in the name of reactionary political formations. 
Um, so we need to then stop Cop City. We need to grow trees in the place of carceral infrastructure um, and defend the Atlanta forest, but not just. This is a, 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 a model of a, a much broader case for uh, a, uh, an expanded environmentalism that is anti-racist, it's decolonial, it's abolitionist, it's environmentally just, um, and it brings together intersectionalist um, compositions of activists and organizers. That's already happening to some degree, but not so much within artistic practices. That's why I want to think like as a, um, as an, a prehensive um, or preempt preemptive uh, form of um, art historical or visual cultural analysis. Often art historians are um, uh, who work on contemporary are stuck in a bind, which is they can only if they can only work on stuff that artists have already treated, right? So because they're writing about the art, it doesn't have to be that way. We can imagine a different relationality where you know the the generation the the, the generative activity of research can itself identify areas of um, that call to being, call into existence, practice. So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, that as well. Um, lots more visual, acti uh, visual um, uh, and aesthetic practices, um, using the, the Momin cartoon and de deturning it so that it operates as a stop cop city meme, um, or the Atlanta Community Press Collective, an independent uh, journalism formation to try to create a different kind of uh, media, really important. I mentioned the, the kind of community builders workshops around Stop Cup City. Uh, Crime Think and this group of people, activists associated with the movement, went to Mexico to Chiapas and did this performance, this theatrical performance at a Zapatista um, uh, meeting. Um, so the this movement is becoming increasingly internationalized. So finally then, this is the last slide. Through these multifaceted inspiring means, the Stop Cop City movement is modeling an impressive solidarity between Atlanta's African-American community, especially community movement builders, the Muscogee people, and indigenous land protectors more broadly, and environmental justice advocates locally and internationally. It's precisely the kind of political coalition, I wanna argue, that's necessary to stop the climate apartheid that threatens our collective future, that uh, Olufemi Taiwo identifies, as I mentioned earlier. Given the multiple moving parts, one clear imperative remains, which is to continue organizing, including with the, within the aesthetic, uh, as a contingent, conflicted site of insurgent struggle, and with a critical analysis of the forces stacked against us. So we need to stay with the struggle. Thank you. That's, that's it. And I think we have time for questions now. Are you okay standing up there? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. All right. Yes, we have time for questions. Hello, good evening. And uh, thank you very much for coming here. I appreciate it. Um, my question is um, not just a question, but maybe a, maybe a different way of thinking in all due respect to you. Um, about your uh, subject on police. And um, you had mentioned a little bit in the beginning that there was a group which was against the idea that maybe police need more funding because it would help them be better. And they thought, well, this is counterproductive for various reasons. Um, and I just want to say, and first of all, before I ask answer, I uh, ask my question, I just want to say this as a person of color, who has also experienced, in, in my opinion, negative experiences with police, um, wouldn't it be fair to say, and this is just a different way of thinking and we can discuss it, um, on the other hand, lessening police power could, number one, um, disenfranchise um, weaker members of my community, because let's be honest, police are usually in areas, neighborhoods of people of color. Um, so 
you know, those police officers who are trying to be honest and uphold law and order, it could disenfranchise weaker members of my community. And number two, could also prevent officers um, from developing skills such as skills to understand people better, skills in psychology and understanding community and understanding people instead of just coming in and saying, well, you know, this is the law and we got to do this and blah, blah, blah. And you got to listen to me. And maybe, it, you know, lessening that could deprive police of being even better police. And I'm just wondering if maybe we can, maybe that's just a different, you know, thing to put in the pond here, if we could say that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question or and, and, the, and the comment. Um, certainly, there's lots of ways to think about this, and it's a, a complex subject. So I'll give you that for sure. I, I think we would disagree on on that, um, uh, although that, that definitely may be the case with some people, right? Like when, when I want to, when I'm saying we should think of the, what I'm trying to think of the police as a structural function, and not thinking so much about individuals who can have a variety of motivations and very well may be good, you know, well intentioned and trying to do the best that they can, including in relation to racial justice, for sure. Um, one person that speaks to this, I, I'm, I'm, or a couple that I found really useful, because I, I can't really go further in answering the question, although I agree it's there's lots to think about here. Uh, one is Alex Vitell, who's written a lot about policing and um, challenges a lot of, um, you know, counter proposals like I think what you're suggesting um, and tries to make an argument why that wouldn't be the solution. Instead, we should think instead of training police more, we should think of doing other kinds of crisis management training and, and community uh, safety uh, mechanisms and organizations like CAHOOTS in, on the West Coast is a really good example of non-policing um, like mental health directed uh, community safety organizing that's really interesting that relieves police of going into situations that um, that should be nonviolent but then often we know all too often turn violent right and that creates huge problems when police are not prepared or ill-equipped to deal with uh, mental health crises. Um, the other one is um, Cedric Johnson, who's a really interesting uh, writer on um, police matters post BLM, who makes all sorts of, I think, important arguments about about this. And um, again, his his response is not to simply or simp even simplistically support defunding the police or abolishing the police, meaning getting rid of the police. That's as, that, as if that could be the answer. It's, ne it's never that for him. It's always, he wants to talk about abolishing the conditions. Like let's get, let's, let's, why don't we dedicate ourselves to, um, to um, mitigating and, and eventually like doing our best to get rid of forms of economic inequality, of social and political inequality. And then we can create uh, uh, the terms where um, policing would look completely different as it does in many other countries, you know, if you if you travel and go to some countries where there's a much greater um, sense of, of social and economic equality, you know, people c commonly think if there's a problem, they can turn to police for help. You know, like often you hear in the States that like that's people do it, but often it leads to disaster. Many people would never turn to the, to the police for help here. So I think that's, I, I love that response and I'm very much, I feel in agreement with uh, Cedric Johnson's approach. Let's, let's think about a more complex and um, uh, comprehensive uh, world in which we abolish the conditions that, that make policing seem necessary today. Yeah, but I, I agree it's, a, it's, it's a complex and there's lots of different views on this. Training them even more, and, 
Thanks uh, so much for your for your talk um, and so many things you said. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit to two questions was the first is to say a little bit more about abolition ecology. And specifically, you, t you showed us examples, but just for for this audience, but and for me, what the role of media is in that abolition ecology, what you see as um, uh, crucial or roles that media plays, um, especially as it moves in these different directions, right? Um, and then the other was to say a little bit more about how you understand even the idea of insurgency and counterinsurgency, just thinking about um, what is that, like, is there, what's that history? What are you drawing on in terms of thinking about insurgency and what that means both metaphorically and in the aesthetic? and in the realm of like history. All right, well, that, that could be easily. <laughs> that could be it's another talk. At least, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, the first um, media and abolition ecology. So I'm, I'm thinking about abolition ecology in relationship to um, um, that discursive or that theoretical political history but also more immediately in relationship to uh, our relation to the more than human environment. Um, if you look at how police deal with uh, nature, often um, nature has to be controlled. It has to be you know, bordered, boundaried, uh, it's commodified, we know, land is uh, property, it's a possession, but it also, uh, in terms of public lands, it has to be cut down, for instance, to create clear sight lines. Uh, so that people can be captured, right, it, to serve security interests, so that there's a non-threatening environment out there. This is this happens in in uh, in Santa Cruz, California, where I'm from. Um, I know I know it happens in lots of other places too. But there's a kind of carceral botany or a car carceral uh, ecology that police, uh, again, as a function, create in terms of the world, and that's one of control of, um, of uh, security uh, and defense against anything that's threatening. Um, so I've thought about this and I've also thought about it in, in relationship to my more like activist and political practice. Um, how can we develop an abolition ecology? This, this has to do also with, with houselessness or you know, people who, or, who are houseless. Um, and in California, there's, there's many people owing to the um, housing unaffordability crisis, owing to mental health issues, owing to, to substance-related um, behaviors, right? It's created conditions of um, increasing number of people on the streets. Uh, and this becomes then a source of policing, not only to justify police, but also uh, in terms of creating police response. And we've found that there's really um, disturbing um, arguments made on the city level in terms of its security and policing about houseless people as almost like being part of the natural environment, but not just also despoiling the natural environment, themselves being like trash or waste or related to it or producing it, you know? So you see how um, carceral ecology uh, ends up not only creating conditions of violence work and policing and control, but also it ends up um, uh, perpetuating boundaries between the human and the non-human, but also creates um, stratifications within the human, right? Especially in terms of class, but also race and ethnicity. So uh, there's a lot of migration and indig indigenous peoples uh, who are have a higher proportion, uh, membership within the demographic group of houselessness. And so police's response to this is to establish a, a kind of carceral um, ecology, to clear sight lines, to control, to sweep, to, to clean, to use the language of cleaning, you know, cleaning house, cleaning people up, cleaning the environment up. And, you know, liberal environmentalists support this also because they're often homeowners and they're invested in private property. So they are invested in it. This is, this is how the logic of um, you know, racialized and class-based 
uh, relations of inequality get manifested um, and people feel good about it. You know, like they're environmentalists. They're, you know, how can, the, how dare these people foul the river in Santa Cruz with their presence and what they're doing? Um, so we've been, me and other people in Santa Cruz, we're thinking about at, like, how can we develop at, like a, 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 a way to think about this? So abolition ecology has been something that we've arrived at is really productive. Um, that means let's not just think about uh, prison abolition. Let's not just think about police abolition, but how can we think more broadly about uh, abolition's connect connection to um, a, a broader, wider politics? And that would be um, an anti-capitalist one. Because ultimately I'm of the argument, I would support the argument that um, broadly speaking, generally speaking, the crisis of, um, of what we're experiencing now in terms of climate, the climate crisis, uh, there is no way that we will, as a society, ever solve this within the conditions of capitalism. That's just a basic kind of eco-Marxism that I, I would argue for. Um, so we want to thank abolition ecology in relationship to a fundamental category of the dominant economic system, which is property. So um, in, in insurgency, getting back to your second question, insurgency would be if, if police is a structural function that protects the uh, and, and maintains the running, the, the clean running of uh, what some call racial colonial capitalism, just in short, right? Um, um, then how does abolition necessarily imply uh, uh, the, the negation of racial colonial capitalism? And so we're, we're thinking about that on the basis of, uh, of property, how to, how to think about an insurgency that is um, not directed at property. What would that mean? That would look at like the commons, or it would look at commoning, ways of creating relationality. Indigenous people um, often propose this term, all my relations, all our relations, relationality. Uh, in other words, not, not, not a carceral college. Car car incarceration, we know, is about creating boundaries and borders, literally in, in, in concrete and steel, right? And keep, keeping people in cages. This is, this is a form of the negation of relationality. So insurgency would be, you know, um, a way to defend and support and, and have relationality thrive um, in all sorts of ways. So an abolition ecology would would do that against um, property. So so that you know we're thinking we're th I'm thinking about that also broad, like broadly in terms of insurgency. Insurgency for me historically brings together all kinds of struggles, struggles of um, of abolition, like anti-racist struggle, struggles of decolonization against. Uh, the colonization of indigenous peoples, which we know continues uh, to this day. Look what's happening in Gaza. Um, and uh, anti-capitalist struggles, struggles for economic justice. So that would be the broad history of insurgencies that I would want to uh, point to since the Haitian Revolution that, that paralleled the French Revolution but radicalized it in terms of an anti-racist, anti-slavery uh, political position. There's lots more to say there, but I, I, I don't want to just get into another. We can talk about it at dinner. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I was wondering, like, based on the fact that a lot of these social justice and, like, overall, like, political movements have taken place on social media, primarily, especially for like college students and other people our age. I was wondering how you feel like social media can be a beneficial tool for generating support and awareness of causes like these and also maybe some downsides of transporting it on social media rather than like on traditional media networks. Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you, because it reminds me also I didn't I didn't I didn't say something else that I wanted to say about media. Um, because I want to, I want to, in terms of uh, um, abolition ecology, we we want to think about media also in terms of uh, the botanical, right? Plants um, are not just documented like in this image, but they're actually media. Um, they're mediums for the generation of political solidarity. So I, I want to. This is what I'm also trying to develop as a form of insurgency. Like plants can be collaborators and comrades. 
plants can be comrades in struggle. The more than human world uh, can be comrades in struggle against conditions of the, the you know, the subjection of, of uh, the world to property um, and, and the rest of it. So this is something that I'm developing uh, in other work. I, I just, at this conference I just came to from, um, I was talking about Gaza. Gaza, you know, it's not just a genocide. Um, I would argue not just genocidal acts, it's also ecocide. Um, and um, we can also, given those conditions, plot forms of resistance that uh, are occurring uh, within Palestinian activities. Um, resistance that comes in the form of comradeship with the botanical and more than human world. So those, that's, that's, that's what... Uh, I would refer to as survival media. So it's media, abolition ecology is, involves survival media, not just survival media as in documentary um, social media or news, news agencies and, and that kind of stuff, journalism, but it, that's also important. But media in terms of um, creating generativity through um, what Karen Barad calls interagential relationalities, um, right? I, this is, I think, really, um, important element, like in the work in the work of Jumana Mana and her film Foragers, or Vivian Sensor's um, um, Heritage Seed uh, Library and Traveling Kitchen. These are examples of practices where uh, botany is part of a, a, a uh, an abolition ecology. Social media is really, yeah, I think social media is really important, uh, but complex. So I, I recently read the book by Jonathan Crary called Scorched Earth. Um, and this came out last year or the year before, I can't remember. Um, and it is, it's written by a senior uh, uh, scholar of visuality um, at Columbia University that is a, um, uh, just a total takedown of social media and the internet. He argues that any future of flourishing and emancipation will necessarily be post-internet. And he makes the argument, if you're interested to read the book, Scorched Earth, um, he makes the argument, he says, social media divides us, it creates atomization, it destroys attention, it creates automization, it's make, turning us all into robots and uh, captured tools of uh, platform capitalism. Uh, it's a doomer takedown. It's like a boomer, doomer takedown of social media. I think he goes like way too far. It's like t totalizing. Um, and I would myself argue that that's that um, like, yes, the answer is not platform capitalism. And as social media users or um, uh, um, participants on on these forums, we have to be aware of that. And we should we should do what we can so that our activity is not participating in the transfer of wealth upwards to billionaire um, tech entrepreneurs like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg. So I think we're, we're living at a time of a massive uh, transfer of wealth upward through platform capitalism and, uh, and social media. So um, artists like Jonas Stahl, who's a Dutch artist, has a, a project called, uh, called Collectivize Facebook. Um, he says, given that, you know, when we, when, we, when we go on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or whatever, we're giving our unpaid labor, we're, we're supplying unpaid labor to these corporations that are recording what we do and our likes and our, our personal preferences, all that stuff, and they're monetizing it, right? We know, I think that's clear, everyone knows that that's going on today, yet we participate in it. Um, but Jonas Stahl argues, if given our unpaid labor, we should demand that we should be the stakeholders. Uh, the public that uses uh, social media should be those who control it and own it. Um, and then maybe we would have a, a much less toxic form of social media, maybe. I think, I think it would be, right? Then it wouldn't be a social media that, for instance, is so toxic toward um, young female-identified people or that's, that inspires um, all sorts of new forms of racism or uh, sexism, all the, you know, all the rest of the toxicity that you find often on uh, social media. But on the other hand, I, I also would argue that it can be and is a really important um, organizing tool of connection internationally as well as locally. 
um, so that when we organize, when we do stuff over social media, as long as we're aware of the counterinsurgency functions, meaning surveillance, because you, you know if you're organizing anything uh, on Signal or wherever, it's, it's, it's vulnerable to um, surveillance. As long as we're, we can recreate conditions of, um, of an effective social media, then it's very useful. So I think Crary's takedown of, um, of the internet, broadly speaking, for its carbon footprint, for its social atomization, for its depoliticization, is, um, is too generalizing and totalizing. Um, and it's like how I ended the talk where I said that um, we have to organize within the aesthetic as a site of struggle. I think I would say that about social media too. Social media is a site of struggle. It's not, it's not this or that necessarily and always. It can go in different directions and it's, it's, it's very complex and it's very fluid and always developing. So, but it's something I think it's crucial to be aware of and also the operations of AI increasingly within social media recommendation algorithms and stuff. Really important to be aware of and bring a critical analysis to. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very well articulated. It made me a little bit envious. Um, uh, my question is, can you talk more about multi-species um, justice? Because when I like think about the phrase, I think about it as like, um, I think about like, uh, like ecosystems and how they're like destroyed through like, you know, the, it, like the building of like cop cities or like suburbs, et cetera, or car centric architecture, et cetera. Um, it's like a kind of different kind of colonialism. It's like, um, but yeah, like it's a different kind of colonialism that we don't like pay a lot of attention to because, you know, we dehumanize, oh, well, I guess that wouldn't be the phrase to use, but we like kind of like strip other animals of like their agency and their right to exist, like anywhere among us at all. Like, you know, like people like uh, express like intense annoyance at like other animals existing in their general vicinity. Um, and like, I'm very interested to hear like more about multi-species justice in relation to abolition ecology in this context. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just, I've just been reading this, this, uh, this book by Malcolm Ferdinand called Decolonial Ecology which is really interesting. And in his introduction, he's making a similar point um, as what you're pointing out uh, also, which is that we know about the horrors of colonization, the horrors of enslavement, um, and the way that people with, among themselves create these awful inequalities and divisions, even forms of dehumanization. The, the human we know is um, an abstract general category that doesn't exist. In actuality, there's all sorts of hierarchies um, still to this day, unfortunately, which that we, we have uh, human rights struggles that are trying to bring about justice on that on that level. But he points out also you, you, we can see something similar in the animal world in the non in the more than human or non-human uh, world. So there's some animals um, who get like uh, they're special animals like polar bears, for instance, or dolphins um, or domestic like cats and dogs. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they, they're kind of special, whereas other animals like farm animals um, are the least appreciated. They're, they're really the wretched of the earth, as maybe uh, Fanon would say. Um, they're used and abused, they're eaten, you know, butchered, eaten. That's the, the, their place is the slaughterhouse. So if you think of the difference between charismatic megafauna like polar bears or whales, let, let's, gener let's dedicate all our environmental energy to protecting the whales but then let's have bacon for breakfast. You know, that indicates a similar kind of stratification of species valuation in the more than human world that in some ways, and he argues it does historically, parallels the stratification of humans in the human world, right? It totally makes sense, I think. Um, so he's proposing as a decolonial ecology, we have to rethink all this, again, in the name of creating another kind of world that's based on relationality, an ethical relationality. Um, what does that look like? That, then it becomes a little complex. Is this leading to 
like necessary vegetarianism? Is it is it against meat eating? Maybe, maybe for some. I, I know it is for some. For others, it's not it's not so clear. There's also a whole environmental justice movement called um, that's part of multi species justice called rights of nature. Uh, why is it humans that only have rights, political rights? You know, um, if uh, one human kills another human, that one human will go to jail. But if a human kills an animal, um, typically, often, they don't go to jail, right? The animal has, doesn't have rights unless they're protected species or something like that. But in general, you can just, you know, swat a mosquito or, or whatever. So rights of nature is a legal paradigm that's proposed to extend rights to the more than human realm. So you could have rights of a river to flourish, the rights of a forest to subsist, the rights of animals to exist without being uh, killed. It gets into very complex details when, when you say, what if one animal like a fox kills another animal like a rabbit? Should the fox be, you know, be uh, pro prosecuted with a crime? No, it, 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 there's there's responses to this, and you can, if you're interested, look into look into uh, Earth law or rights of nature, and there's deep discussion of what this could mean. But in the meantime, we can go after obvious things, like when a corporation um, just uh, um, pollutes a river and destroys its its uh, livelihood. That would be an example of the possibilities of um, of rights of nature. It's something that rights of nature could fix right now. But this is all about, you know, the question, broadly speaking, is what is multi-species justice? It's about thinking about justice. Um, uh, you know, justice meaning what is right, what's ethically good. Um, personally, I, lo I love Cornell West's definition of justice, where he says it's love made public. Um, so what does that mean to bring that to um, the world beyond merely the human? So in principle, I totally support that. I think that we obviously have to do that. And that, that's a long-standing position of, so, of what's called social ecology. The idea that what, you know, what humans do to the world mirrors what they do to themselves. So uh, a society that is continually at war, producing weapons of mass destruction and all that, it's not surprising that at the same time they're destroying uh, the environment. So this goes back to like the 1960s. Murray Bookchin and people like that were writing about social ecology. Um, how we treat, how humans treat the environment is similar to how men treat women within patriarchy. That's another you know, important eco-feminist uh, way of thinking about correlating human justice with multi-species justice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, completely. Yeah, so it's important to think critically about anthropocentrism. Uh, like, why is why do humans have sovereignty and no other species has any seeming agency, at least historically? But that's that's a great way of putting it. I, I appreciate your explanation. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, the. Uh, eco-terrorism that's more or less going on in Gaza right now. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's if it's not already, it's becoming one of the most polluted sites on Earth. And historically, the U.S. military has been one of the biggest polluters, if not the biggest polluter in human history. So, yeah, I was wondering if you could go in a little more on that. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, 
so what we seem to be um, witnessing is um, a form of um, like war ecology, basically, of uh, in the interests of an ethno-nationalist project that cannot ultimately tolerate uh, a certain form of life within its occupied territories. So the genocidal acts have to do with the military elimination of that form of life. I um, mean, it turns out that the elimination in, entails not just killing people, but killing conditions of livability. Um, and that's where ecocide, or s what has you know more familiarly been called um, scorched earth policy, has that's how it's operated in the past. And it's not just Israel; like other governments have done this historically, including the U.S. Like when the U.S. in Vietnam decided to destroy, to use chemical agents to destroy um, forests to get the uh, militant resistors to come out, to deprive them of their um, you know, hidden and, and safe areas. That was a form of scorched earth policy. Or what the US did through um, its proxies in Guatemala in the 1980s and 90s during the dirty wars in Latin America. You know, just not not just destroying indigenous people, but destroying their whole conditions of livelihood. So it seems to be Gaza is an example of the production of a space of unlivability, uh, or a, a kill zone, or a sacrifice zone. Um, so that's what seems to be going on, and yeah, it, it has to do with dropping a huge amount of uh, of bombs on the territory. Um, not only that, but targeting um, trees and greenhouses and uh, water sources um, and the soil and air. Um, this is all documented. Friends, some forensic architecture's recent work that just come, came out a few weeks ago um, on Gaza is detailing um, ecocide as a part of a genocidal project. So um, I think also I, there was just a, a really excellent article by Andreas Malm um, in uh, his Verso blog about what's happening in Gaza from a fossil fuel perspective. Um, because what, you know, there's a long history of fossil fuels enabling Western colonization and imperial control of the rest of the world. And we're seeing the, the continuation of that, he argues, in, uh, in Gaza. So what he's referring to is the fact that Israel in the last few years has started to become a fossil fuel producing state through offshore uh, natural gas sources um, in the Mediterranean. So these are currently being explored um, by companies in coordination with Israel. Uh, and that's thought to be, that, I'm not suggesting that, he's not suggesting that's, that's the reason for what's happening in Gaza, but that's an, a further element of it. Um, so not only is Israel creating conditions of um, a, a worsening form of climate breakdown by this, car, these, you know, the, the bombs are also carbon bombs. And they're also destroying conditions of livability uh, so that nothing can grow within toxic conditions, including Palestinian people. Uh, but they're also at the same time transitioning to um, developing not only a security economy, but a fossil fuel economy. So it's really, it's really fascinating, but, but very, um, very dark. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm continuing to think about that, what's happening there. Um, and it's, it's not, just in Gaza, it's also happening in other places. And I'm, I'm thinking like Haiti is another important site where we're witnessing a, a form of um, social breakdown that is also um, incredibly violent um, and a kind of war ecology that's related to um, a kind of construction of a sacrifice zone that's hundreds of years old actually. Not that we must end on a hopeful note, uh, but I, I, with the question about uh, multi-species justice, more than human perspectives, I thought we, excuse me, I thought we had maybe got there, but we're going to end instead on this perhaps very realistic note. Of, I'll say uh, a little bit more so that it's not so dark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you'd like, I mean, I think I, my my point is not to 
um, bring this up because it's so devastating and depressing, right? Even though it is that. Uh, but I, I would argue we have to be, we should be aware of this stuff and think about it critically so that we can, um, you know, be able to, to imagine conditions of, um, of being otherwise. I think this is really this is really crucial. I'm 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 I've just I've also just been reading uh, this this guy, uh, Calvin Warren, who's writing about Afro pessimism, um, Af and and he has it's a very dark perspective about anti black violence. But he says um, that he's one of the most hopeful people he he knows uh, because he he's freed himself from the naive. Uh, I would I would say liberal belief that we can make things better within the current system, because that we know leads to a, a kind of cruel optimism, where we keep trying but we're getting nowhere. So for him, he's saying it's hopeful. Like once, and I agree with this part. If we critically analyze conditions um, and we know what we have to do, at least we can imagine a, a world otherwise and, and begin to do the work to get there. Yeah, thank you for that. And. I, I think that's a more articulate version of what I was going to suggest, which is that perhaps it is in the diversity of tactics that you are proposing for us, uh, that you have presented to us over the course of this talk, which has been quite broad in its uh, forms of ecology in which we witness the uh, a plurality of steps forward, I would say. Uh, TJ, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. See you next week. For the students, a round of applause for TJ. Yeah, thank you very much. Abolition. That is your sign-out word. Once you have uh, written it, you are free to go. Thank you. <laughs>